this is Sienna, and you are listening to the King of the Mountain podcast. All right, one to the two, two to the three, and a place to be. It's BQ with the King of the Mountain podcast covering Impact once again this week. Please hit subscribe, give a thumbs up, and leave a comment in the section. If you're new to the channel, definitely want your subscription because I upload a lot of great content throughout the week. A lot of very exclusive content, including uh, I just uploaded the interview with Sienna. It's a very, uh, very raw, uncut interview. It's a type of interview as a Global Force Wrestling fan you actually want to hear because you you hear what she thinks when she gets to come to WWE comments and what she thinks about the trolls and the ne- negativity and the contract talk and all that. So it's all on the on the interview. So make sure you check out Talking Armageddon with Sienna. It's here on the station, on the channel. So please hit that subscribe button. I just spoke with Ali last night. And that's a a very different interview than the Sienna one, obviously. They're two completely different people that carry themselves two totally different ways. But it was a really great, really fun interview. And that's coming coming up real soon. So please hit that subscribe button to make sure you do not miss out. Doesn't matter if you're here on YouTube, if you're here on Podbean. Apple Podcasts, and if you are an Apple Podcast slash iTunes, please give me a four, not, not a four, don't give me a four, give me a five star rating, please, leave a comment, say something nice, and I would appreciate it, because it'll kind of help me catapult above some of these other podcasts who stink. So, um, after having about four weeks of the listenership go up, 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 had a slight dip this week, but it was still in the, uh, the realm of week four, so... Everything is doing good with the podcast right now. Getting ready to hit 700 subscribers on the YouTube channel. So if you haven't done it, please do so. Shouts out to all the other podcasting colleagues out there. I spotlighted the Delvin Cox experience on my channel. He uh, interviewed me as a matter of fact. So check that out if you haven't already. And all my other podcast colleagues, much love to you guys, especially the Impact Heads and the Heelcast. If you're on Facebook and want a really great Facebook fan page to be a part of, Impact Fan Zone is the place to be. I'm now a moderator on that site. So just go to facebook.com slash impact wrestling FZ for fan zone. So real easy impact wrestling FZ. A piece of content that I've been uploading the last week that has been very popular is the GFW Impact Live Report, where I sat down with someone who was actually at the live shows and we talked about what it was really like. So you don't have to listen to the dirt sheets or read what they say or when you see the podcast, hear the podcast that are talking about the disappointing crowd. And okay, listen to what I have, listen to my interviews, my sit downs, and we talk about what what it was really like there. You definitely don't want to miss it. And with all that being said, with all the marketing out of the way, my guest host today is my first UK guest host. And it is Adam. What is up with you, Adam? How you doing this afternoon for you? Yes, I was going to say good evening to you, but I realize it's uh, mid-morning for you as well. Uh, I'm well, thanks, BQ. <laughs> yeah, I just woke up a little while ago. It took me a little while to roll out of bed like I like I absolutely wanted to, but, but I am up. I am up. I've got my coffee, and I'm feeling good. Before we get into Impact, I want to be transparent here for a second with the listeners and state my gratitude and appreciation for all the kind words that have been said about myself and the podcast and the channel in the last week or two, especially. And especially those of you who tagged Sienna to let her know you love the interview. Not that I want to blow up her notifications, but you know, I am trying to get it out there that, you know, that this podcast and this channel is the is the place to be for the Global Force wrestlers and the and the news and all the positive talk. But I really want to let everyone know i appreciate just to be a little transparent i did lose my job this week and even though i have another job starting a much better job starting up in a few months i kind of i kind of dropped the ball i did something stupid and and uh lost my job this week and uh, i've never lost a job in my life but and i'll bounce back you know i'm not i'm not too concerned i have other income but it still was a big uh kick to the gut But all the positivity that I've been getting from the listeners has really helped me get through this week. So I really want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. And uh, but but also don't worry about me because I I'm very resilient and uh, I will be absolutely fine. So no worries. Let it let us talk about impact. Um, Adam, as a whole, what were you thinking about 
the episode before we kind of get into it match by match? Uh, yes, it, it was okay. I mean, I was um, privileged enough to be at the tapings, uh, although I wasn't at this night because this was the last night of, of the previous tapings. I, I was there for quite a few of, of the nights. I was there for the uh, Slammiversary pay-per-view and two of the middle nights of the week. But this overall show, show um, was, was okay. It was pretty good. It set some things up going forward. It was, you know, neither great, neither awful for me. So let me ask you, actually, you might have told me that, and maybe it just w- completely went over my head that you were at the at the tapings. Um, were, you, were you part of the group that had to stand in the storm? Uh... Well, funny enough, that was the one night that uh, I didn't go. So I think that was the first night of, of the, the Impact taping. So I was there for Slammiversary, then I missed a night, and then I was back on the uh, 4th of July, which is the Tuesday and uh, the Wednesday night. So, no, I missed the storm, thankfully. That okay. wasn't the one where I had to stand there. So, yeah, uh, I missed the last night and I missed uh, the, the first night of, of Impact tapings. But uh, the crowds are still pretty good, though. All right, so your your opinion uh, being in the impact zone because we talk about this a lot on the podcast. I've been in the impact zone about five or six times. Mm-hmm. Um, what is your opinion on the energy and volume of the crowd when you are there in the impact zone compared to what you hear on TV? Well, I was quite privileged in that we got um, in fairly quickly. I went with my daughter, and uh, so we were like the first row. Not not at ringside seats, but you know they have the bleachers, so the first row of the bleachers. So um, we're in quite a vocal area, right center, you know, right in the center. Um, but the one thing was noticeable, especially on the night that I went by myself, which was the the second night of, t- of tapings of, of Impact, I suppose the Slammiversary, was that they get in a lot of people from the parks who are excited to get in, but after they see the first match, a lot of them start to leave. And, and I think that's the problem of, of filming at the impact zone is that there's this you know, nice big crowd reaction. And because they're seeing maybe some of the, the tapings for explosion or, or whatever it may be, some of the lower card matches, I think the, the casual fans don't stay around. And that has an impact. And, and certainly for me, I was there three nights. I was getting a bit tired towards the end as well. Although uh, I did mark out when EC3 uh, got the, the, the title. Uh, so it's been a long time since I actually marked out at, at a wrestling moment, but that was one of them. Um, so the energy was quite good around me, but it, it was thinning out as the week went on and certainly as the evenings went on. Yeah, and that's my experience too, is that three hours is a long time to watch wrestling. Man, I think a lot of even WWE fans who watch Raw every week say the same thing. It's a lot, and especially when you're there. And sometimes that translates really poorly to TV. Because it might be like last night's, I shouldn't say last night, but last night for you, but a couple nights ago for me with Impact, it comes across as a brand new episode of Impact, but that was really the last hour and a half of, of tapings for the people in the Impact Zone. And, and you're usually fairly tired by that point. Absolutely. And if you watch back the last four or five weeks, you'll see the same people at the front every week with different tops on. Um, so, you know, these people were there for pretty much, you know, the four or five nights, which is the same front row every night. And for them, they must've been quite tired. Well, one thing I will say, actually, if you don't mind, PQ, is, is uh, before, we're not going to get into the show here, but, but I just wanted to mention about Del Rio. Uh, sorry, Al Patron. Keep calling it Del Rio. Apologies about that. Um, I don't particularly like the guy. I never liked him when he was in WWE. Uh, and I wasn't very excited when he signed for, for Global Force, but, my daughter, this is her first experience of wrestling, and she absolutely loves the guy. And most of the crowd there, going back to the crowd thing again, is that they want him to be a heel in Global Force, no doubt about it. You know, uh, they they were cheering uh, LAX, you know, the the, 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 the Smarks, if you want to call them, whatever you want to call them. But um, the one thing that came over about Al Patron was that he was actually brilliant live. He was... He came over as such a decent guy. And if, if I was a casual fan like my, my daughter was, I think the people would have really liked him. And I think the problem that we have with, with the wrestling community online is that a lot of people kind of follow each other and they don't like the guy because of all the backstage reporting. But for my daughter who doesn't know something like that, he did come over as a real baby face at the tapings. Yeah, same with my kids. My kids uh, really react to him. I was there when he debuted, like the night that he just showed up and... It's unfortunate because they had to heavily edit that for TV because they the 
jumbotron behind him they misspelled his name <laughs> but but i wish that that reaction would have come out over on tv because it was it was huge um there's no doubt in my mind that wasn't one of the biggest pops in, in that in, in the impact zone in a while it was a. Uh, I mean i i popped up out of my seat uh i know my wife next to me and she's like oh my god she meant that more of a negative way <laughs> she didn't <laughs> like him but um yeah it was really cool um you you kind of made a comment about the the park goers and stuff, and I, from my experience, there has never been that many park goers in there. I've always felt when I people watch and look around that they appear to be wrestling fans to me. Uh, just when I say people watch, I don't mean they're just chanting or che cheering just to do it, but I see them reacting to certain people or or getting involved in some of the chants and stuff like that. I've never got a feel that there was as many park goers as you know, maybe the dirt sheets want to let you know, but what was your experience? Did you, re do you think that there's quite a bit in there or no? Well, uh, maybe it's been a bit unfair because Slammiversary, it was sold out. Well, I say sold out. It was full, you know, and, and it stayed full for the whole evening. And there was a lot of, uh, uh friends of, um, the, uh, running back guy. Um, what's his name? Uh, Angelo Williams. Was that yeah, his name? Yeah. Or? D'Angelo Williams. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so a, a big section of the crowd were his family and things like that. So that was packed. The next night I went was the 4th of July. So the parks themselves were absolutely heaving. Uh, you know, they were really, really busy. And because it also the weather wasn't great in the evening, I think a lot of them came in to get out of, uh, you know, the inclement weather outside. And they stayed around for maybe the first two matches to the first interval and then left. Uh, but the other night I went, the, the, the Wednesday night, it it wasn't as busy generally anyway, so they didn't get as many park goers in there. Okay. Um, but certainly yeah. on the 4th of July, it was there was a big contingent. And, and it felt like Slammiversary in that when it started off, it was, you know, to, filled to the rafters, literally. Uh, but then it thinned out as, as the night went on. Okay. Yeah, uh, times that I've been there too, um, I guess depending on the weather, yeah. Because I've only ever seen like one person in the park being like, hey, Impact Wrestling, it's not it's not like they, they have like 20 people walking through and trying to recruit people. You know, it's, it's I'm mm. just over ever seen like one or two people, maybe like at the entrance or something like that. But, um, but, uh, before we, uh, move on, just, just, uh, did you, do you feel like it's louder in the impact zone than it comes out on TV though? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the, uh, in, you know, cause I, once again, I was surrounded by people who were obviously, uh, global force fans. And in the section I was, it was very, very loud, you know, and, and we are unconscious of the fact, you know, I'm a big Global Force fan, so I want them to do well. You know, they, they've let me do interviews with their stars in the past and those kind of things. So I'm always rooting for them to do well. So, you know, I made sure me and my daughter were shouting, you know, and and, you know, so from around where we were sat, it was very, very loud. But, you know, it, it certainly is better in the crowd than it is does come over on telly. Yeah. And I want to tell the listeners just just for a second next week for Destination X or, or any show, just listen for a second. Just sit and listen for a second to the the ring announcer, to the to the bumps in the ring, to the wrestlers yelling at each other. Listen to the volume of that and how compressed it is compared to the announcers. And then think the audience is right behind all that. So just you know, the entrance music, all that. Just just have two different ears next time and I think it's going to paint a picture of how, how condensed that, uh, that audio truly is. All right. So we kick it off with Sienna in the middle of the ring and she is, uh, calling out everybody's favorite Karen Jarrett. And, um, I will say I was a little bit, I was expecting something a little more special for destination X, not to say Gail Kim wasn't special, but of course, Karen Jarrett kind of hyped this up. Like, they were going to do something very different with the knockouts this time around. You know, if you watched her, uh, you know, backstage interviews regarding this and everything, it didn't seem like she was going to announce a standard one-on-one -on -one match. But she she calls Karen Jarrett out, uh, Karen Jarrett out, and this wasn't a bad a bad segment. Um, calls her out, and about ten seconds through Karen Jarrett talking, I realized she was going to bring Gail Kim out. And uh, as, as, like I said, I was kind of expecting, kind of hoping for something a little bit different and special. But is this what you thought was going to be 
the opponent here? Did you think this was going to be one on one? Were you expecting something kind of different, like I was? Uh, I was expecting something different, and uh, the reason being is that uh, I feel that Rosemary's been a bit shortchanged, and I also think there's there's quite I've ever other few people kicking around the fringes, you know, whether there be free talent, uh, you know, free agents who could come in on this spot, and, and the problem that I had with it overall is that the crowd because they are mainly wrestling fans don't like Karen when she comes out, you know, she comes out like she's a big baby face and she's lovely when you meet her, but it, it kind of kills the, the, you know, the, the vibe in the, in, in the, in the audience. And then on top of that, you've got Gail Kim, who's possibly one of the best female wrestlers in the business. But once again, on the mic, she stinks. Well, she doesn't stink, but she's just boring. She saps any energy out of any section. And it's a bit of a shame that the three of them together, Sienna, I, I really like that the three of them together, it really did have, you know, the old buzzkill on it. Right. I, I like the. I mean, I like the opening um, sit, sit out. I don't know what they call those. Sit, sit, st- <laughs> There's a term sit out or state staging or something where um, Sienna was sitting there and said, I'm not leaving here till I get an answer about Destination mm-hmm. X. And I think the average fan is kind even though we haven't seen Gail Kim compete in a while, I think the average fan is kind of done with the Gail Kim title shots the the unearned title shots uh you know call it call it the john cena factor call it the um i'm trying to think of a a ring of honor reference i don't know if i have one for ring of honor but uh someone who just like regardless of what they're doing is just always entitled to a shot at the gold (laughs) and that's um as popular as i think gail kim is and i was there for bound for glory for the uh hall of fame and i mean the place was nuts for her you know um i think she's popular but Storyline wise, people were kind of done with the Gail Kim title shots, and uh, yeah, I wasn't expecting it. I thought the brawl was was okay. The only problem it didn't it, it lacked a little bit of heat, only because. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't really remember very much Gail Kim and Sienna um, mixing it up up to this point. The, the only time I can remember is when Sienna threatened. Karen and then Addy ran in Laurel ran in and then Gail came in as well that's the only time I think for memory yeah so I think on screen wise I, d- I don't recall much heat between these two no not at all okay no. so so I don't think the uh the brawl maybe came across as they had hoped it did but but it was it was good it was fine and with Karen there was an episode about two months ago where she cut the opening promo of uh Impact and she zapped the crowd out of it for almost half the show i mean her her uh opening dialogue was so long and dry and boring that you could hear a pin drop and the crowd never recovered from it i think the company learned something from that sense because we haven't seen her come out like that you know except for little segments with sienna where sienna kind of has to carry it but but i still with all that being said this should be a excellent match for uh, Destination X, and um, you know, I, I think I speak for everyone. We were kind of hoping for kind of a surprise. We know there's going to be some new knockouts coming. Maybe that will still factor into this. We don't know, but I hate to fantasy book too much. I, I, I've got a feeling that it's going to be a straight up match for some reason. I don't think there's going to be any shenanigans. I, I, I don't know why. I just I know they're going to be coming at some point, but I, I think there'll be a clean win for. Well, I say clean win. She'll pin her in the in the center, but uh, I think Sienna will win the match with some interference by KM or something like that along the way. I, I, I'm i going with Sienna with this too. I really think she's going to pull it off. She's really the only heel on the roster right now. I mean, there's a couple. There's Angelina. There's uh, And even though Davey's done with the company, Angelina's still retweeting and talking. So that's usually a pretty good sign that she's, you know, she's not going anywhere. Uh, but Angelina's still around. Uh, Laurel's there, but she's obviously not a competitor for the gold. So I just think right now it makes sense to keep the title on Sienna and uh and we'll see so opening match was uh Marafuji and El Hijo de Fantasma against Laredo Kid Garza Jr. I ex- I expected this match to be a little bit better than it was here's my issue I don't know how much you know about Marafuji but he's pretty freaking good and with the exception of the last tag match he was in I think uh, with Eddie Edwards and maybe Moose were his partners, or I don't remember exactly who his partners were. 
mm-hmm. he almost comes across as like a jobber. Like he did, he he didn't get a lot of offense in in this match. There was when he got his very first t- uh, tag in, he ran right into a code breaker or a lung blower, what do you, whatever you want to call it. I mean, he ran right into a move. <laughs> it's uh, it, it, yeah, you're right. Uh, I, I saw him, you know. I think he did a match for Explosion, which I don't know if you guys get over in the States as well when I was at the tapings. But he is really, really good. But you just got the feeling with with all of the talent that came in from Crash, AAA, and et cetera, and Noah, that they weren't booked as stars. Uh, none of them were particularly booked to what they can do, except for obviously ones in um, the, the X Division final, aren't they? Right. Yeah, but but no, you're right. In that match, it was a bit of a shame that he was booked and you know his his offense was was pretty poor. But the problem I had with the match is that th- th- there was no real reason to it. It was just there, you know. It was a match thrown on telly for for no apparent reason in my eyes. Right, exactly. So when you have a match like that, that are two uh, four great talents and a very random pairing, and it's your opening match, it should be kind of like the opening match at Slammiversary where it was just boom, 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 go, 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 action, action, action. So that's what I was expecting out of this match because there's no heat to it. There's no heels. So when you don't have heels, you can't work a slow match. It has to be very fast pace. Kind of like the, uh, we'll talk about it later, Ishimori and ACH. But even though I did enjoy it, I was I was hoping for just, just to kick it up a notch just, just a little bit more and and definitely for... Marafuji to uh, get a little more offense in. That was bothering me quite a bit. My daughter's a huge fan of his, and I was just so glad that I didn't call her to tell her to watch this or to watch the uh, Grand Championship <laughs> match because he looked terrible in both of them. Well, the, the thing is, to me, the point of wrestling is that, it, well, there should be a point to it, and, and that there was no point to this match. You know, winning or losing it had no consequences. It didn't mean that they were going on to a title shot. It didn't mean, but maybe they'll build to that. I don't know, but. Th- that they should have been that in there, you know, the um, veterans of war who had the backstage fight at the beginning of the uh, of the show. They they look like they're going to be involved in the the title scene, yet they haven't wrestled in God knows how long have they? Uh, from from memory, well they, well they did tonight obviously, but right. So Marafuji and El Hijo de Fantasma win this match, which I didn't expect at all. I, I fully expected mm. Laredo and Garza. So to your point. You know, the outside guys don't come across like stars and they seem to lose. But in this match, they uh, they pulled it off and they won. So I was happy to see at least Marafuji got the, the victory here. But you're talking about LAX. And this was something I pointed out on the podcast not too long ago. I'm Puerto Rican like a majority of LAX is. We're, um, we're citizens of the United States. I, I was born in the United States, but my parents weren't. Um, but there's no green card. There's no you know, uh, visa, nothing like that. We're part of the United States and most Puerto Ricans for decades and decades have been wanted, wanting to be the 51st state of the United States. So to have this like USA versus LAX, um, dynamic is not, I guess it's believable to people who don't really understand what I'm just saying. But for me, I'm sitting at home. I'm like, our country's part of the United States. What is the, where is this dynamic here of this uh, you know because there was the segment not long ago where there was a fan obviously staged but whole, you know waving the United States flag in the crowd and LAX is just losing their minds like I was like what but uh it, it's a little random and as you said they haven't wrestled in how you know in a while uh, they've been on the losing end the last time they were in the ring and you know they randomly came down to help El Patron a week or two ago. So it was really random, but I will say I actually enjoyed this match because I thought it was the best showing that VOW has um, put out in a while. Well, I, I thought the match was really good. And, you know, um, it, it, you know, the fact that they tied, was it Wilcox or Mayweather? I can't remember which one they, they, they handcuffed to the, to the ropes. You know, I think that's always a great way to get heat and, and to get the win and, you know, and, and do it that way. It was great to see LAX win as well. Um, as you say, they, they've been jobbers. They're the most... Uh, being in the crowd, they're the most over-faction in the whole of, the, uh, of G Global Force. And they've been booked like jobbers. 
I, I listened to the podcast he did the other week where Del, uh, Al Patron went through them in the gauntlet match. I mean, that was just terrible booking for them. Right. I should never, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to go back over that. But that, that's, you know, there's this force apparently, and um, apparently a big difference between them being jobbers and the force is low key, which doesn't make any sense to me. If he was the main difference that's going to turn this faction into winners, it shouldn't be. It's just been booked quite poorly. But I'm glad they're back on winning track and the, the audience loved them honestly the even though they're supposed to be heels the impact zone were cheering them every time they came out right and it's okay to be i've always said i'm not a big fan of cool heels but as long as you're not playing to the crowd and um you know i, I always use a uh, donovan dijack and ring of honor as a uh as an example because that was the last ring of honor pay-per-view i ever ordered and the last one i will ever order but he he was the uh, heel in a match, and he was he was doing some flips and all. And he he's very impressive. I'm not taking that away from him. And then he jumped on the uh, the barrier and started playing up the crowd and trying to get a a pop and a reaction and a, this is awesome and all that stuff. Um, I don't like that. It's okay. I think it's okay if the cra- if the crowd likes the heel, but but be a heel on you know like like Eli Drake doesn't play to the crowd. As far as, okay, I'm going to do a move and then I start, you know, running around the crowd trying to get a reaction. Like, he's still 100% heel when he's out there with everything he says and does. And I think that's what makes LAX work. I don't think you have to, like, turn them or anything. As long as you, you're heel and you do heel stuff um, and work good, ang- you know, big angles with good baby faces, I think it works. But I'll say with this one, I was really impressed with Wilcox. Uh, he had to wrestle a majority of this match by himself. And I actually thought he looked really good, whether on the receiving end or the uh, offensive end of the match. I actually thought he looked really, really good. And the uh, the spot where he went through the table at the end was really good. But LAX needed this win. God God knows. I like um, the Veterans of War. I think they're a really good tag team. But uh, when we I went to the UK tapings a couple of years ago, it was a, it was a time when... Gunner was doing stuff with, uh, who was it? I think he's doing his program with James Storm at the time. And he was talking about being a Marine and things like that. And it doesn't resonate with the international crowd. Uh, crowd. And that, that's that's part of the problem with that gimmick, which is why I think making baby faces may not be the best thing. I, I think they should be more mercenaries, like the APA used to be in WWE. Yeah. You know, I, I think that kind of tweak to them would be better. But having said that, then you start to turn them heel or, or maybe tweener, I don't know. But um, I, I like them. I really like them. I think they've got a lot to offer as a tag team. And uh, I hope they do go on and, and, and become tag champions at some point. I like them too. I mean, I'm a, I'm a veteran like they are, so I, I, can't, um, I can't say anything bad about them. But hmm. uh, they probably do need a little bit of a tweak. And, and maybe that mercenary role is something they're looking at because when they randomly came down to help El Patron, I mean, maybe... Maybe that kind of is what they're doing, but I feel like they got away from the military stuff a little bit this time because when they came down, let's say Crimson, but uh, Mayweather didn't have the the bullets, the rounds um, around his torso. They didn't do the salute. They just kind of came down. So maybe they're toning it down a little bit because uh, I, I say this as a proud American. We're the we're the least patriotic country in the in the world, and uh, I don't think that gimmick works as well as it would in another country mm-hmm. um you know but that just uh just my thoughts so but as individuals i like them by the way you know i don't need to think that i don't like them i do like them as individuals and i like them I even like the idea of, of the team but uh i don't think that they work as baby faces uh well certainly not to in the long run i, I think they, they've got to have a, another edge to them is where i'm coming from on that one yeah and we do need to see another heel team in the company um, OVE is debuting at Destination X. I've known this for a while that that was their de- their uh, debut date because I'm uh, have a connection to them. But you know they obviously made it uh, public knowledge that they're coming. My assumption is that those guys are going to be heels, and I think they're going to be over almost as much as LAX. <laughs> so I think we're going to have a problem in the tag division here um, with, with the the heels being the most over uh, parts of the division, but. We got Congo Kong versus Grado and Joseph Park. I've uh, I don't know what what are your thoughts about this storyline in general because I'm there's certain times where I really like it and then there's times that I don't and I'm I haven't been in the middle. 
Well, well, first things first. Uh, I know Grodo. Um, he actually lives quite close to me, and uh, I've, I've met him socially a few times. He's, he's a really top guy, and and it's always sad when people you see you know some people commenting on the show and saying, "Oh my God, Grado's on." He's a guilty pleasure of mine. He really is. I, I, I like him, and I like Joseph Park uh, in the way that's being portrayed. The problem that I have with this, and it, it's something that's rife in wrestling, that quite often good guys get involved with things which are quite unpleasant when you think about them in the real world. He's after a green card marriage. <laughs> you know, yeah. he, he's an illegal immigrant trying to get into the country. You know, I think I'd be wrong. You know, it's all done tongue in cheek, uh, but he's taken advantage of someone who's been jilted at the altar. Okay. She wasn't very nice uh, and playing on her emotions. So, it, you know, it's a guilty pleasure, but it's, it's funny how sometimes the booking and the creative put faces in heelish scenarios and uh, that, that, that's all i can say about it but i like i like the segment the other thing i didn't like is is kong took down park and um grado together so we're saying that kong is better than steiner now in reality because you've got two wrestlers against him and they can't beat him whereas an announcer can beat uh, Scott Steiner, you know, so once again, the booking doesn't really make much sense in that for me, you know, that there's no con continuity with it. So it was a short match. Um, you know, they, they of course sell Joseph Park as someone who, who can't work or compete. You know, he's not a abyss, you know, they, they, they sell him as, you know, he goes out there and doesn't know what he's doing and, mm. you know, they got their ass kicked in under three minutes. Um, the reason I, I like the storyline is I, I like Grado too. My wife is that's her favorite wrestler, Grado. She mm. she almost cried when he got that uh, fired briefcase last year <laughs> and the feasts are fired. But um I do I do like Grado. I, I don't hate the angle. I just I, I think I wish I had uh, maybe it's just bugging me because I don't know where they're going with it. You know, I like to well, at least have some kind of foresight of where's it where is this going. Where do you think it's gonna go? Uh, I hate to be a fantasy booker, but I think there's going to be a wedding and she stands him up and she, um, that begins her transition into the old Laurel. Mm. That's my, uh, th where I'm going with it. I, I think she's been brilliant in it and I, I really like her gimmick, but as you say, it's only got a limited shelf life and she's yeah. going to have to do something with it eventually. But yeah, I, I can see that having that he gets stood up at the altar. And you're right. She's been doing tremendous work and people, people like to say, Oh, she needs to go back to wrestling. I mean, what to, to do what, like to just be a, a vanilla wrestler. And I mean, we, we want characters, we want storylines. That's what makes this fun. She, she has her whole career to be Laurel Van Ness, the regular wrestler, you know, enjoy, mm -hmm. enjoy this right now, because this is funny. The dress is disgusting. Um, so I don't I don't know where it's going with it. I just wish it was moving a little quicker. This was the big curveball here. Um, Tyrus comes down, and when the music played, even though I own all the music from Shop Impact, the <laughs> this, the music played. I was like, who the hell is that? I, I I really didn't recognize it because I hadn't heard it in so long. And Tyrus comes down, and um, do you remember the WWF days, the Twin Towers? Uh, Akeem and the Boss Man. Yeah, well, I remember them as individual. I can't remember as a tag team, but carry on. Yeah, okay. So I was literally wa listening to a Bruce Pritchard uh, podcast. I hate him on screen, but he actually has a pretty good show. I was listening to uh, Bruce Pritchard on YouTube, and he was talking about Akeem. And I remember the Twin Tower days, and I was thinking in my head, man, like I would, I kind of want to see a modern day like Twin Towers, like two big monsters, two big fat guys on a team. And see what they can do with it. I mean, we're in a work rate era and the big monsters aren't as popular, but I kind of wanted to see it. Um, and then randomly that day, I'm watching this and Tyrus comes out. And I didn't realize Tyrus and Congo Kong were the same size. I had no idea. I thought Tyrus was smaller than Congo Kong, but mm -hmm. I thought they had the stare off and I thought they were going to pair up. The. Do you think that at all, or you just you really didn't care? Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing that bothered me about it was Tyrus has been the bodyguard for a heel for the last God knows how long. And so it was a heel coming down to stop another heel. And once again, it's that continuity that bothered me about it. But um, 
I think Tyrus is underrated. I think he's a great speaker. You know, I, I love his, the, you know, the, the segments that he does. Um, I didn't get the impression that they were going to be, you know, tagging together or any time in the future. I think, if anything, they will have a, a confrontation of some sort. Yeah, I think so. I, I mean, that's where the, I'd listen to um, Tyrus' uh, YouTube segment. He just said there's only one monster, or one bully in this company. That's what he was saying. So it is setting something up between the two of them, which I, I like them as a tag team much better than I do as opponents. I don't think people are going to buy into that match at all if that if that's what happens. But it's like you said, he's been you know how long in the uh, in, in the heel side, and there was even a. a you know, because now we're assuming Bruce is a heel, but there was a point where he was paired up with Bruce while Bruce was a babyface. So it, there's no continuity with Tyrus, and it just it just further complicates the storyline. <laughs> you add Tyrus into it now, of all people, where you don't even know what that guy's doing, and all of a sudden you add him to this, and it's like, oh my god, what are they doing with this? So, well, yeah, yeah. So I, I don't know what it's going to be. I don't know if um, the I don't know. You just got no idea why he's been introduced into this segment. I mean, where does it leave? I mean, maybe Grado and Laurel will go off and do their own thing while he's preoccupied with Kong's and preoccupied with Tyrus. I don't know, but it just seems a random throw into it because surely the point of, of a good wrestling storyline arc is that the good guys get beaten down by the bad guys all the time. And eventually the bad guys get their comeuppance, but Grado and Joseph Park, they're acting heelishly by trying to bury their way into the country. Um, and then the way that they get back at Kong is to get a bigger guy to go and beat him up. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it just doesn't make sense to me. You know, the good guys aren't getting their, their, their rewards, you know, for having a beat down from Kong. And I, I just don't understand it sometimes that the, 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 cre the creative team just leave me mystified at times, puzzled. I will say this much. We've had a lot of storylines over the last year year and a half whether it's the broken angle whether it's uh the lvn braxton wedding there's been a lot of angles where you're like where the hell is this going and then when it's all said and done you're kind of like all right i like it so maybe That's there's true. just so many curveballs that we're just you know maybe at the end of this we're gonna be like oh shit okay this this was cool so we'll see um i think that's, i think that's fair to say yeah I, I, by the way all those things that you've mentioned i've quite enjoyed them all uh, I prefer storyline driven wrestling than just, you know, fantastic technical stuff. So, I, I do too. Uh, I'm happy to see where it goes. And I, for the record, as I said, I like Grado and Joseph Park. I, I think they, they serve a lot um, to, to the show. I, I think it adds a lot. So Bobby Lashley and Matt Seidel have a sit down with Dutch Mantel. So we've had um, all, all the uh, authority figures that have been making an appearance on this show. And uh, that usually doesn't bode well for uh entertainment purposes we usually can take one of them maybe two of them but they're they're all kind of like showing up on this show but they do a sit down and apparently this is going to be a new segment on youtube because i think dutchman said it was going to be uh a new segment the, i thought this was well done but it was very lashley and eddie it's almost like we're just seeing lashley eddie edwards part two you know what i mean because it's, it's like he's um oh you're just in the x division and and Seidel's kind of got this anything can happen, anything is possible mindset. So they're kind of redoing the storyline with Eddie Edwards. But it, it was it was nice enough. It, it was it was good enough. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And, you know, I, I don't didn't I like that program, by the way. But you felt that um, Eddie Edwards had uh, a lot more. I was going to say goodwill baggage with him because he'd been on the show for quite a long time by that point as the Wolves. And, you know, so you wanted him to win, whereas I don't really care about Matt. You know, he, he turned up at these tapings, won a couple of matches, and now he's in a program with Lashley. And, you know, not I, I don't want him to win as much as I, you know, I'd actually hope that Lashley squashes him. I know that's awful to say, but, you know, that, that's the way I hope it goes. We got the Super X Cup tournament match, the uh, final one in the first round, which is uh, not the first round, but the second round, which is ACH, who I feel like we haven't seen in years because he was in the... Uh, second match, uh, versus Ishimori. And I thought this was phenomenal. I, I thought it was better than the, uh, opening tag match. You know, I've seen some reviews. I've read some reviews saying the opening tag match was better than this. I, I don't think so at all. I thought, uh, I thought this was really good. I think 
there might have been some editing to the match where we missed a couple spots. I don't know because it, it just seemed like ACH was taking, taken out of it very quickly all of a sudden. But uh, I thought, that for me, this was my favorite match of the Super X Cup tournament. This was the one I was uh, by far most uh, most excited. I'll say, not I won't say most excited for, but the one I, I was most invested into. Uh, I thought Ishimori and, and uh, Davey Richards was really fun too, but what do you think of this one uh, compared to the other Super X Cup matches? Yeah, uh, I think Ishimori is is fantastic, and um, one of the problems with him is obviously the language barrier. Which you know, do you really want? Well, I suppose it's not so much of an issue, but it's why I think he's most probably not going to win it. Is that they'll want someone who can talk on the mic uh, to win it? But as as this match was, I thought it was fantastic, and, and Ishimori has, has been brilliant in every match, and I did like the. Uh, Davy Richards match that you had, uh, which I thought was excellent as well. And that was my favorite of the matches. Sorry. So, do you think the Super X Cup thing has been a success and everything so far? Because the company has come up with some pretty good ideas over the years, and they always come, they fall, end up falling super flat. I, th- I think this one's is working though. Yeah, absolutely, and and it gives a reason for these matches. And that's what I was saying at the beginning that at least with the, the, these tie-ups there's a reason for it that you're going to win the uh, super X cup at the end of it. Whereas, you know, the opening tag match, no reason to it. And that was my problem with it. So yeah, I, I'm all for these tournaments. I, I absolutely am. Uh, and I, I think, as I said, this match was excellent. It was really good. I would have liked a scenario where they had all the matches on one card, but I know they're not going to do that because they would, they would end up drawing uh, comparisons to the uh, cruiserweight classic. And even though this is this was been done first, and it's something completely different, <laughs> you know, obviously the comparisons are going to be there. Comparisons have already been there uh, for people trying to troll the company. There's <laughs> plenty of those. Um, yeah, you're right. It could have been a, a one night only, almost, couldn't it? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. But those, uh, but the one night only's are. It, it don't matter if if uh, they have the Royal Rumble itself on a one night only. It's it's a. Uh, when I'd only just usually fall very flat, you know, I still order them. I still enjoy them, but I've, uh, I forgot who was, who said it. It was, uh, the Anthem owner. His name is escaping me at the moment, but he, uh, he has said in 2018, the, uh, one night only's were going to be taken much more seriously. So, uh, Nordheim, is that his name? Nordheim? Yeah. 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 Ed, um, yeah, yeah. He's, he said it's in, Next year is going to be a lot more uh, taken seriously because here in the states that's a pay per view for us. It's not, it's a very cheap pay per view. It doesn't cost that much, but it's a pay per view. It's it's revenue they could have if they made people want to order them. But when you're kind of saying, "Hey, this is kind of like a house show," uh, what I like about it is the audio is a little bit is not as compressed, so you can actually hear the mm. crowd a lot better on them. But um, yeah. To give you my opinion on one nights only, they're, they're free in the UK, right? And I still don't, I don't watch them. Okay. <laughs> or if I do, if I do, I fast forward through them. But I tend not to watch them because I know it's not advancing any storyline. It's a, as you say, it's a one nighter. So uh, it, it's a strange concept to me. It, it really is a strange concept. That was it's a Dixie Carter brainchild, um, because I know with the overseas partners they have to deliver a monthly pay per view. But I think it was, I believe it was a Dixie Carter brainchild where she's like, okay, we're gonna do these one night onlys that are like house shows and they're not gonna matter. And when you're telling people something doesn't matter, they're you know obviously when you're hyping something up like Destination X, you want to be like, this is must see, this is this and this and this. So people are gonna tune in. But if you are saying, hey, this really doesn't matter at the end of the day, um, that's how the fans are gonna see it too. So. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, what do we got after that? After the uh, Super X Cup where Ishimori wins and we're going to get Ishimori and Desmond Xavier in the finals, so that should be a lot of fun. Uh, we get um, Lashley, Loki, and Trevor Lee versus Alberto El Patron, Sanjay Dutt, and Matt Seidel. Uh, this match got a lot of time. I was, I've often been critical about... Uh, like how WWE books main events before pay-per-views where they just throw these clusterfuck tag teams together of people who are facing each other. That is, that's something that I never had interest in, but I kind of bought it this time around because the matchups were so fresh. I mean, we haven't seen Lashley mix it up with Sanjay and 
Um, really not with Matt Seidel either, with the exception of their couple run-ins. Um, you know, we haven't seen low. Well, I think we have. No, I don't know if we've seen Loki with Matt Seidel or not, but you know, Trevor Lee and Patron. I mean, there, there was fresh matchups in this, so this was fun for me, and I felt like the crowd really woke up for it too. I can tell Alberto gets a reaction out there, whether it's good or bad. The crowd seems to really wake up when he's out there. I think he has a level level of confidence that he he um, performs in that that he got from WWE because when you're dealing with those really big audiences, you have to magnify your confidence and your charisma by a hundred. So I think I think he just knows how to go out there and really make the crowd react. And I think that's a very good positive thing about him. What were your thoughts on the main event? I personally loved it. Yep. Uh, I, I thought it was really good as well. And as you said, it was very, very fresh. Uh, I, I like it when they, they put guys together who are having three separate feuds and, you know, put them all in the same ring. I, I always like that concept. I always have. You know, it's a good way to just freshen up a feud. Uh, you know, because you can have a feud going for a long time, but then suddenly if you then, you know, introduce another feud and mix them all together, I think it works quite well. Um, so, you know, Trevor Lee, by the way, I think is brilliant. He, he's one of my favorite guys on the roster. He, Eli Drake's my favorite, but Trevor Lee's up there as well. And I, I tell you how good he is. Uh, once again, my daughter doesn't know anything you know, about wrestling. And she saw the, these couple of weeks. She said, I really don't like that guy. So he's, he's doing something right. And, and bearing in mind, he hadn't talked pretty much before this run. Uh, he was always being uh, Shane Helms was his mouthpiece. I think he's done brilliantly and he's been great. Really, really good. He really has. Helms, I mean, we now see how much Helms was actually holding him back. And mm -hmm. I don't know if you listened to the conference call or not with the X Division guys, but I always said, okay, Trevor Lee's out of here when his contract is up. He's going to chase the Hardys, chase the Helms, what, you know, Helms, whatever. Now I'm thinking, I mean, based off, you know, his famed comments saying 205 Live is garbage um, and the <laughs> way he's being push on the show right now it's almost like they're saying okay trevor we want you to stick around we're gonna let you we're gonna let you run with this show us what you can do something we want them to want to see with eli drake as well but it seems like they're kind of telling trevor lee okay let's see what you can do it's been very enjoyable i think him wrestling with the belt was hilarious <laughs> i think that's the funniest shit in the world and to your point how you said about you know i said i'm not a big fan of it you said you are when you have main events where they uh, mm. pair up guys like this I think it works if you don't give away too much of the matches so for instance El Patron got in got into with Loki a couple times but it was more like El Patron whooping his ass and chasing him around the ring they weren't like the two of them paired each other paired with each other during the match in a slow point where they're exchanging moves exchanging holds you know it, it's like it's they have interaction, but it's very quick. Um, so I think it works in that in that sense. I really liked it. I mean, there was a lot of instances where you thought the match was over, and it and it um it continued without seeming like overkill. It wasn't like the Ring of Honor near fall where you're like, oh my god, when is this over? Uh, they just hit him with three finishers in a row, and he kicked out. What the hell? You know. <laughs> well, uh, that, that was what's good about the ending. That uh, you know Lashley. Um, planted, it was, Son was it Sanjay? I think it was Sanjay who took yeah. the pin, wasn't it? Yeah. And then uh, Warriors way from the top. And, uh, you know, it just made the, the heels just come over as really badass at the end. And it was good. It was really good. I, I liked it. And, you know, every one of those feuds now going into Destination X feels like there's something that matters. And I would say most probably those three feuds, out of all of them, are the, are the best three feuds in the company. Absolutely. They are the best feuds going on right now. And, um, yeah, I, th I thought they built everything up really, really well. And I think it was, it was, uh, it was necessary for Loki to get the victory to look strong going into the world title match with El Patron. Um, we needed Sanjay to look a little weak because he's going into the, um, X division match where he's trying to get his title back. So you need to build that sympathy a little bit, which he hasn't had up to this point. Sanjay comes to a relatively dead crowd when he's out there so he kind of needed that 
needed that going for him a little bit. And then you got Lashley and Seidel where you don't know what's going to go on with them. So this was booked masterfully. I, I probably dissect it more than, than most people, but I, I thought this was uh, done really, really well. So The, the one criticism I have of the show overall was that uh, Eli Drake's disappeared again. He's picked up a couple of wins over the last couple of weeks, and he just wasn't even on this show unless I missed him. Uh, I know he was at the, the Staten Island t- uh, taping, well, not tapings, uh, shows, but uh, I, I don't know what they're doing with him. They seem, they must know, they must read uh, dirt sheets and things, and they must know that Eli Drake is loved by the crowd. So I just understand why they didn't have him on the show, even I in know. a backstage segment. I was thinking the same thing. I really was. I, I was like, where is Eli Drake? He got that victory in the four-way a couple weeks ago. It wasn't a number one contendership match, nothing like that. It was just a pointless match, and he won it. And you think, okay, is he going to get some momentum out of this or, or what? But nothing. Do, do you know what? I'd have even enjoyed him doing a backstage segment with the Swole mates. You know, maybe that's pushing it a bit far, but you know, even something like, you know, watching him work out at the gym and, and making some comment, but at least have him on the show so we don't forget about him. Right, because if you remember when when Anthem took over, Eli Drake's, from the very beginning, this was from March now, his whole thing was, okay, everyone's getting TV time but me. Everyone's getting random title shots but me. That has been the narrative for him for several months, but there's no progression in that. It's like he could still he could show up on Destination X and say and cut the same exact promo. Mm-hmm. You know, there's there's I, been no progression. I, I think he really needs to come out and drop a pipe bomb, or or come in, out and interfere in in the main event. I, I I don't know. He just needs something to do because he's uh, last two feuds that he's been in, if you can call them that, even have been uh, with partial celebrities, haven't they? With uh, an NFL star and two. Uh, meatheads. I can right. say that because I'm on another continent. I'm not afraid they're going to turn up. Right, and the th- the thing that would devastate us fans is if, like NXT was came down the road and and snatched them away. That would be devastating for us, and it would be the company's fault if that happens. He conducted an interview that uh, got posted a day or a day or two ago online, and he he said he's very happy where he's at. That he that no financial offer has been made made to him that makes any kind of sense to leave the company. And um, he's getting up there in age, so we we hope that that window closes <laughs> for him to go somewhere else. But you never know because, you know, WWE signing guys in their 40s that are former TNA guys. Um, but we don't want to lose them. We really don't. But decent, decent episode of Impact. The crowd... Um, the crowd killed it a little bit. I'm, you know, I'm willing to, I'm willing to buy that they stood in the uh, in a storm. I'm, I'm very willing to buy that. I can't say that if I was standing in the rain for even 20 minutes that I would have uh, went in there like the happiest fan in the world. So, <laughs> you know, I'm willing to buy that. But with that being said, there's this group of people in the front row just resting on the barriers, not making a single. I mean, clap, do something. Not a single reaction. And they're the same guys each week. If, if you go back the last four or five weeks, and the reason I spotted them is because they were in front of me in the queue, and one of them was wearing, um, I think he was wearing an Aston Villa top, which was uh, it's a British football team, uh, soccer team, I should say, for you guys. Uh, and he was, he's wearing various different soccer tops throughout the week. So that, that's why I, I kind of noticed him, and he's there. And as you said, he, he barely clapped. He barely clapped at the whole, t- the whole five shows. So, you know. If you're not enjoying it, why'd you go? Yeah, allow yourself to be entertained. I mean, I go to indie shows where I don't know a single person there, but I'll still, you know, um, I'll still partake in booing the heel, clap. And when I see something I like, I'll at least clap. I mean, you don't even have to be a wrestling fan. Like, like they could say, say the Impact Zone is all part goers. Like, you don't even have to be a wrestling fan, but you can go in there and if you see something you like, you clap. You you show something. I, I I just don't understand just sitting there like that. Mm. But uh, they were there all week, and it's a shame because you know a lot of the fans that are around me who I saw the, the the several nights they were really into it. They really enjoyed it. But the ones who were front and center uh, ringside, you know, on the on the, on the, the railings, they look bored, mindless, and you just think, why put yourself through that if you don't actually enjoy it? Right. 
it would come across so different on TV if just that little small section was going crazy. Mm. Because because all the focus is on that on the front row, the people that you see. And if they have a reaction, if they start chanting, it's going to look like the whole crowd is into it by by proxy. I mean, they're, they're right there in the middle. Um, but I but looking past them, I could see the bleachers were um, pretty engaged and everything. It's just, it's just that that freaking group there. Uh, <laughs> and they're British fans. They're my brethren. They're British. So I apologize on behalf of uh, the UK and Europe. For them. <laughs> <laughs> anyway so i'm looking forward to these, these shows coming up and and i don't know uh who's going to turn up but there's some big names out there at the moment and hopefully we'll, we'll see some of them right so we're supposed to get a couple of debuting knockouts in these tapings i kind of just hope we just know who they are at destination x because you know the way spoilers are uh, fortunately i i avoid them very well pretty good i um i'm i'm past the point of googling impact period or global force i just don't do it anymore and uh i, w- I, I kind of want to but i signed up for google alerts so i usually get the news emailed to me but um i'm, I'm past the point of googling it because I, I just see spoilers and someone um someone dm me a spoiler the other day and if anyone listens to my show for even five seconds they know i freaking don't do spoilers and someone dm me oh L- low-key join lax and I said, did you just did you just tell me a spoiler? And he's like, well, it's not a spoiler because Conan said it on his podcast. I'm like, I don't listen to Conan's podcast. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> so, so I was a little I was a little bothered by that. Um, before I let you go here, because this you know we're uh, coming to the end of Impact, um, I'm going to give you the uh, Destination X lineup, and I want to know your your predictions for each okay. match. I, and if I make any wild predictions, by the way, this is not based on any knowledge that I have. This is pure speculation. I haven't read anything. I don't know anything that's going on. Okay, so if I predict something like, I don't know, uh, Mickey James turns up and wins the the knockouts title, and she does, it's a fluke. Okay, I just wanted to get that out there. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, Matt Seidel versus Lashley. Uh, I think it's going to be Lashley. Well. Uh, uh, Sorry, one thing we didn't cover was that huge segment that they talked about Lashley going MA or not. Maybe that's going to have it. I tell you what, what happens in real life will depend on who wins that match. If he is going to go back to MMA, Sadal will win it. Uh, but I think that Lashley will win and stay in wrestling. Okay. And I think that whole MMA or not is a lot more storyline driven than initially reported by the dirt sheets. Hmm. Um, do, you, do you think do you think they're taking the mick out of Lesnar and his rumors about uh, going back to UFC? Do you think that's what that's all about? Uh, I don't know. I haven't um, I haven't even thought about it like that. I don't think so because I think the Lashley thing came up a little bit before that. Okay. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, Ishi, Super X Cup Finals, which is uh, okay. Never mind. Ishimori versus Desmond Xavier Super X Cup Finals. I just think it's going to be Desmond just because of the language thing. I know that's an awful thing to say, but uh, I do think that if they want someone to win, that they're going to have someone who can cut a promo afterwards and most probably hang around and, and be a top star. And uh, although uh, he's great, I, I just don't think that he's going to have an impact on television. Trevor Lee versus Sanjay Dutt, X Division title ladder match. Ooh, Trevor Lee. All right. Just because I like him. That's no other reason. <laughs> uh, Gail Kim versus Sienna. I know I gave, uh, I said I think Sienna's going to win and it's going to be because of uh, KM. I'm actually going to change that. I'm going to make a, uh, a prediction of Taryn Terrell turning up and screwing over Gail Kim. I don't know why. It just uh, she had some beef with her before, didn't she? And uh, I think that might, and it was a fantastic feud. Drew Galloway's no longer there, so there's no longer that issue. There you go. That's my prediction. The Sienna will win because Taryn Terrell will turn up. My, uh, as I've already said twice on this podcast, I hate to fantasy book because I think that ruins wrestling when, when, when you, um, that's why I hate the WrestleZone podcast because they uh, fantasy book so much that it conditions people to be disappointed when things don't happen. But I, um, I really think Taryn's going to show up at some point. I've, I, 
I don't know much about her personal life and what she's got going on. I know she just popped up back on Twitter uh, maybe three weeks ago. Um, I, I just, you know, it didn't work out with Brooke. They tried to bring Brooke back, and I think uh, she couldn't come to terms with the new management. So I just got this feeling that Taryn is uh, somehow going to pop up, and if they did do that, because Karen actually teased a return as well on the uh, – on the teleconference, she's, they said, um, they asked her, who are you looking at to join the knockouts division? And she's like that, well, that would be very counterintuitive for me to tell you who is going to debut or return, you know, so kind of teased it. And then the, uh, global championship match, which is low key and El Patron. Um, I can't see low key winning it. I just can't. And the, the, the only other person I could imagine would be, uh, once again, it, it, it's tough because of Al Patron's personal circumstances. Is that a reason to take it off him? Is he working as a baby face? I don't know. Uh, oh, Rey Mysterio apparently coming in. You know, I, I know you talked about it on the on the show before. So um, you know, could he be the one to come in? I don't know. I'm going to go for Al Patron, but there's going to be some screwy finish. So some shenanigans in that. It's not going to be a straight up match. All right, fair enough. What do you think on that one? Um, I'm actually going with low key to be honest, and and the reason that I am is that I think they need some kind of shock value for this show being a live event. It's almost a. It's not really fair for El Patron to be dealing with what he's been dealing with. We don't know how much is false, how much of it is truth. I think it's a unhealthy relationship. So I don't think there's. I don't think everything is a total lie and I don't think everything's the 100% truth either. But that aside, the reason I'm going with low key is because I can't, I can't envision a scenario where El Patron beats LAX again. Mm. It, It would be one thing if the whole tapings LAX is just beating this dude down and, and he just cannot get one up on him. And then he gets his comeuppance. At Destination X, but he's he he beats them or beats them up every time they meet. I was like, there's no, <laughs> there's no way. It's so. uh, some screwed up, messed up booking, isn't it? Um, yeah, he's just they've just been an annoyance to him. They haven't been a threat. They've just been an annoyance. Um, yeah. So yeah, I don't know. The, the problem I have with that is I just can't imagine Low Key as champion. That, that's that's the issue I have with it. Right. Uh, is there no EC3 match with um, the Grand Championship? Oh, gosh, you're right. Well, that doesn't fit the X Division. Uh, the, I don't think that fits the show. So but, they're just not going to have it on there, I'm guessing. Yeah, right. but uh, you know, but we were missing him on this show. I'd, I would have at least liked the promo with you know him making out the belt or something. Mm. Fair enough. But, all right, folks, so that's going to do it for the King of the Mountain podcast this week. Hope you enjoyed. Uh, much thanks to Adam for swinging by and talking impact and don't forget to subscribe to the channel and we will talk to you guys soon. All right. Peace.